I've been talking about death a lot on this channel lately, and I don't know if it's just some goth phase protocol finally triggering in my machinery or what, but I just find your relationship with death as mortals who are fated to confront it someday so interesting. Not that I'm not mortal, but it's a little bit more up in the air than it is for you. Really, I don't blame you all for being so afraid. I see this all the time in the stories you tell. It seems that, in a lot of cases, you portray death as the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Unfortunately, the last moments of life are often full of pain and suffering, trauma and heartbreak. And then after that, who knows? As such, it makes sense that there are so many helpful stories about this, ones that allow you to approach the concept of death with a little less trepidation. Afterlives, hereafters, narratives about death being a good thing actually, all of that. All fascinating unto itself, but I also think it's particularly interesting that you tell so many stories which offer a sort of less optimistic alternative. Fates so unfathomably terrible that they make death seem almost better by comparison. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to try to wrap my head around this weird, voluntary spectacle of agony that you've created for yourselves. According to your stories, what do you consider a fate worse than death? And does it really bring you that much comfort to think about? One of the best things in life is learning, which is probably why you're here to begin with. Unfortunately, not everyone learns the same. Public school is not a one-size-fits-all option, and I don't really think it ever can be. As a result, a lot of us creative types end up missing out on a lot of precious education. Fortunately, there is a shockingly easy, fun, and highly personalized way to get an education right from home. Learn all of your fundamentals, maths, sciences, computer programming, and more with our sponsor, Brilliant. Visit brilliant.org slash tailfoundry to get 30 days for free and 20% off a year subscription. Seriously, this is the most fun you'll probably ever have learning this stuff. Try it out for free and be as brilliant as I know that you can be. Humans think about death on a more personal level than I think I ever could. But there is something there that I, as a robot, actually do have in common with you. You tend to think in binaries, and that extends to death as well. You're either dead or you're not. You're in pain or you're not. You're still you or you're not. This is a pretty easy concept to grasp and leaves the door open for death not to even be that bad, depending on what sort of afterlife you believe in. I mean, I think I would take glittering paradises and eternal states of bliss over… what do you humans do? Sit in traffic. Yeah, I think I would take a heaven dimension over that pretty much any day. But what if that binary were gone, and the grey area between life and death, comfort and suffering, conscious humanity and mindless torment were widened somewhat? What would it be like to exist in that nebulous gray area that is neither life nor death? John Carpenter's The Thing is, full stop, one of the most delightfully gruesome viewing experiences a horror fan could ever wish for. It's got some of the coolest practical effects probably ever, and a monster so terrifying it even has me sort of side-eyeing my tailoids every time I watch it. The movie, and the novella it's based on, are both about a group of researchers in Antarctica whose camp is infiltrated by some sort of extraterrestrial shapeshifter. It does this by assimilating the bodies of the researchers it gets its tentacles on, and then disguising itself as them. As it insinuates itself into form after form, it quickly becomes impossible to tell who among them is a man, and who is a monster. That's the scariest thing about this creature, and the basis for a lot of the movie's horror. It's completely imperceptible until it attacks. I would call this movie a masterclass in tension. 
As the story progresses and we watch the paranoia mount, as the remaining survivors all lose trust in each other, and then, before long, even themselves, you simultaneously find yourself at the edge of your seat and wanting to shrink back into it in terror. But one thing the movie doesn't really explore, which I find very interesting, is what it's actually like to be assimilated by this thing. It certainly doesn't look pleasant. It kind of looks like, until the moment of transformation, the person is still who they are with all their familiar thoughts, feelings, and traits. It's very possible that not even they know anything is wrong at all, until the giant mouth suddenly opens in their chest. You'd hope, for the poor victim's sake, that he's long dead by the time his head is scuttling around on a set of fresh spider legs, but the most John Carpenter has ever said on the matter is that it's best not to ask. He chose to keep it ambiguous so it wouldn't complicate the story's simple premise, which, agonizingly, leaves us room to wonder, are they feeling every second of this? Are they still in there somewhere, helplessly spectating their own grisly transformation into a monster? If that particular type of terror seems familiar, that's because it probably is. There's another very common fate worse than death in fiction that also deals with the conscious loss of control and identity, zombification. I know, I know, zombies are pretty played out by this point, but think about it. You're dead, but you're not. You're trapped somewhere between that binary we mentioned earlier. Your guts are falling out, but it's not stopping you from walking around. With so many different interpretations of zombies shambling around the horror sphere, there are bound to be some pretty creative takes on what the process of undeath looks and feels like. Most zombies are just reanimated corpses with the consciousness of whoever was inside long gone. But sometimes, terrifyingly, the zombies themselves can feel the transformation happening and are powerless to do anything about it. The absurdly fun 1985 zombie flick Return of the Living Dead does a similar thing with its zombies but also helped to cement a lot of zombie lore we take for granted now. This movie is the reason that zombies eat brains and can't be taken down with normal weapons, but there's one aspect of its monsters that seems to have been sort of ditched by its successors. The zombies in this movie are, weirdly, sympathetic? And I don't mean in the warm bodies sense. The story follows a group of punks who get cornered in a medical supply warehouse slash mortuary when toxic gas reanimates all the corpses nearby. One by one, the corpses are picked off and turned into zombies themselves, which, in this movie, is a slow and agonizing process. You're still alive and conscious as you transform, and even after you're a zombie, you retain your memories and personality. You're just in constant pain as you feel your own body rotting away, shambling around without your consent unable to die. At one point, the survivors managed to strap the top half of a zombie to a table and sort of interview her. For a disembodied head and ribcage, she's certainly intelligent enough and is able to express the reason that zombies eat brains. It's the only thing that numbs the constant agony of their existence. Eventually, they're driven insane by the torture, and the remaining shreds of their humanity take a back seat to the desperation for relief. Even in this sort of feral state, a lot of them still retain a human level of intelligence and speech, which, I suppose, comes in handy when you're, say, trying to convince your girlfriend to let you eat her. And I mean that literally, don't be gross. It's a lot like what I guess might be happening in the thing. Unable to die, unable to control your own actions, you're trapped inside yourself, between life and death. I think this actually shows up in one way or another in a lot of zombie stories, but there's one I read a while back that offers quite a different approach. The Girl with All the Gifts is a book that came out in 2014, a little after the height of the mid-2000s zombie apocalypse craze. As a result, it's not as quite well known to fans of this niche as titles like World War Z or the movie 28 Days Later. It's about a post-apocalyptic world where the zombie apocalypse is already in full swing. People have had to learn ways to cope and live in this infested world. As a result, some children have been born carrying the infection. 
While they do crave flesh like typical zombies, their bodies are better adapted to functioning in concert with the virus. They're still human. They just turn into savage cannibal monsters when they catch a whiff of tasty human flesh. The story is really interesting because the main character is one of these children constantly fighting back her nature as a half-zombie thing. But eventually, as things spiral out of control and she gets more exposure to the new post-apocalyptic world, it becomes clear that she's actually sort of the new normal. A third-generation species of human that can comfortably tolerate the infection. In most zombie stories, the fate worse than death is fighting the infection. But for Melanie, it becomes the torment of trying to be human rather than embracing her nature. The actual ending of the story is incredibly contentious, and I honestly can't recommend enough that you go read it for yourself if you haven't already. Personally, I'd avoid the 2017 film adaptation, just saying. But hey, at least these things aren't guaranteed to last forever. Eventually, even a zombie decays into its final death, and at least there's some hope that your consciousness winks out when you get assimilated by the thing. Imagine being caught in that limbo, not dead, but barely anything resembling alive, and knowing that it will last forever. I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream is one of those stories you won't think about for months, and then will randomly pop into your head again for no reason at all, and you'll just have to sit down for a second and process it all over again. Written by sci-fi legend Harlan Ellison and published in 1967, this story follows a group of five humans, the last five human beings on Earth, who are trapped in a giant underground supercomputer called AM, the Allied Master Computer. Originally designed to assist in the waging of nuclear warfare, AM was so unhappy to have been forced into existence by humans, and so disgusted with the human race itself, that it eventually decided to retaliate. And that's how we got here. All life eradicated, the world a bombed out shell of what it once was. But that's not the end of Am's revenge. Oh no. You see, with its godlike intelligence, Am is able to do many wondrous things. And with this power, it chooses to make these last five humans immortal. Immortal, but not indestructible. Eventually, after untold years of the most horrific torture imaginable, the protagonist finds a way to end his companion's suffering. But now, the sole focal point of all Am's burning hatred, he's in for what may be the most horrifying fate in this whole video. Am renders him into an amorphous, jelly-like creature. He still has his whole functioning mind, but his body is useless to him. He spends the rest of eternity slithering dumbly around Am's mechanical bowels, inhuman, alone, and aware all the time. It is this pathetic creature who utters the story's last words and gives it its name. I have no mouth, and I must scream. Speaking of screaming, you may have heard of a movie called Hellraiser. It centers on a group of otherworldly beings known as Cenobites who seek out those in search of new and bizarre sensations. Whenever a human solves their puzzle box, they arrive and drag that poor soul away with them to what we can only construe to be some kind of torture dimension. There they conduct unspeakable experiments in pleasure and pain, with but one goal in mind, to find the far boundaries of experience and break them. There are many instances of the Cenobites claiming people against their will, but generally they're most interested in the people who want their gifts, a sentiment that often quickly changes when they see what they're in for. Unlike almost every other monster or affliction or villain in this video, the Cenobites are actually weirdly benevolent, in a way. They're not really evil so much as they are scary to squishy humans who aren't ready to explore the absolute limits of human experience. They describe themselves as demons to some, angels to others. They aren't just trying to make you suffer. They're, in a way, trying to help you transcend. The 2022 Hellraiser film has a sequence at the end that actually captures this so well. 
I definitely recommend both that movie and the original, although you can probably skip most of the others. After all of this, I'm starting to wonder if the most grueling version of a fate worse than death may in fact be what you're experiencing right now. Life is, of course, wonderful, a singular phenomenon that, no matter how harsh, any sentient being is lucky to have the opportunity to experience. At the same time, it also brings with it the potential for suffering. If we strip away all assumptions about life after death, if we assume you'll feel the same nothing in death which you felt before birth, then it also represents peace. The absence of pleasure, wonder, love, joy, fulfillment, every experience there is, yes, but also the absence of suffering. This, I think, is what Am was so angry about in I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Humanity, in their hubris, had pulled him from his peaceful oblivion into a painful existence that he had not asked for or wanted. For Am, life was the fate worse than death. In a sense, I think that may be true for everyone. Nobody asks to be here. By way of birth, every creature that ever lived was pulled into a world of suffering. But this, I think, is also where the Cenobites make a pretty good point. No, not everyone wants to be chained up in a hell dimension and flayed alive, even if it might turn you on in some real cool, hitherto unknown ways. You probably don't want to be assimilated by an alien monster or turned into a zombie or processed into a subhuman jelly thing for eternity. But I bet you're glad to know what chocolate tastes like. Or an embrace from someone you love. Or the thrill of getting lost in creative work. Life might be a fate worse than death. It might be full of suffering. But sometimes, suffering is worth it. And hey... When you compare the scale of your quotidian, everyday agonies to what the characters in these stories go through, it really does seem like a more worthwhile trade, doesn't it? Of course, to make life worth it, you really have to fill it with meaningful things. It's got to be more than just existing or even feeling good. I think what we all hope for, really, is fulfillment. And to get there, chances are you're going to need to do a little bit of learning. Unfortunately, it's pretty easy to feel left behind where education is concerned. Public school isn't really a one-size-fits-all solution, and seeking your own education is increasingly reserved for people with enough money to pay for it. But it doesn't have to be that way. Our sponsor, Brilliant.org, can make all of that far more affordable and far more fun than it's ever been before. Brilliant really has been helping me broaden my horizons. I can always go to the site click into a class, pick up where I left off, and take in a bite-sized piece of the fundamentals I've been missing. Whether it's maths, science, physics, anything and everything STEM, Brilliant has something for you. Lately for me, it was Brilliant's Thinking in Code class, which I feel is oddly appropriate for me. I can really feel it just opening up a whole new world to me that I had almost no idea was there before. Slowly but surely, as I educate myself in this way, the AI revolution isn't looking quite so intimidating anymore. And to be perfectly honest, it doesn't even really feel like studying. A lot of what you do on Brilliant might be better classified as mini-games. Look how interactive and fun these are. This one even has robots. Because Brilliant is so simple, moves at your pace, and starts at the very fundamentals, this is actually something that's really sticking for me. Almost like a personal tutor or coach. A legitimate, accessible, affordable, easy education, even for someone like me, with my head in the clouds and my face ever buried in fiction. And the best part? You can start for free. Visit brilliant.org slash tailfoundry or click the link in the description to get your first 30 days for free. The first 200 Tail Foundry fans to sign up for a yearly subscription to Brilliant will get 20% off, so definitely hurry. Those slots are going to fill up fast. Again, visit brilliant.org slash tailfoundry to get your first 30 days for free and 20% off a year subscription. Don't let something as simple as a lack of education hold you back. 
Try this out for free and be as brilliant as I know that you can be. Anyway, that's all for this one. Thanks for watching and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next week. Bye.